to the Livable Houston meeting. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot going on in Houston, and I want to make a couple of announcements and suggestions. Uh, first, if you don't know about our website, Houston Tomorrow, we have a new website, and it is rich. There's a lot going on, it changes every day. And we're covering this economic recovery plan as it develops every day, particularly as it relates to Houston and Texas. So there's some new information there about what would happen in Houston and Texas if what's on the table right now is passed. Of course, it won't be the same thing. The House is voting today on, uh, actually about now, apparently, on, on some aspect of this. So we'll see what that turns out to be and then some more later to go. But you know, HoustonTomorrow.org, and there's some stuff back here if you want to pick one of these up to remind yourself about that. Uh, also, if you sign up for our email, everything that's on here once a week or so, we send out a newsletter. And if you're not getting that and you'd like to, um, there is a sign up list back over here on the table too. Uh, also, we have a uh, Facebook group now, whatever exactly that will be. <laughs> and uh, and where, how do you do that? You go to Facebook groups, search Houston tomorrow? Yeah, okay. And uh, I've just joined the last few days, and it's really amazing what that's all about. You know, people you haven't heard from for years all of a sudden say, wow, I didn't know. You know so, cool. Um, KG and several of you are, are all KG seems to spend an enormous amount of time. Also, if you go to groups, there's a group called uh, Facebookers for New Urbanism. That's pretty interesting to see you kind of that. So, that's the only one I found right away that sort of relates to what we're doing. I'm sure that's more. It's a new world. Um, also, I want to tell you about a group called Transportation for America. It's a national organization. Uh, it is totally focused on transportation. It started to deal with the transportation reauthorization bill that will come later in the year, which tells, you know, it sort of dictates what happens for about three years. But now they've gotten refocused for the moment on an economic recovery plan, trying to get more transit, more uh, walk event, walking money, so a lot of things that uh, better energy stuff. So, you know, that's a big fight. So two things. One is, please, if you're an organization that could join Transportation for America, it doesn't cost anything, you just become a member and then you'll start getting this information, which is, by the way, a lot <laughs> every day. Occasionally asking you to sign on to some initiative like Vote Today, flurry of organizations joining the back the position of Transportation for America. And this is uh, an organization that is, uh, or an effort that is co chaired by Smart Growth America, which I'm on the board of. So it's, a, it's probably the, it's the core of all the sort of what I would consider rational transportation thinking in America, and that's everybody's in the National Association of Realtors, ARC, or, you know, lots of groups. So I, I would say, I think I could say it's a safe thing to back. So, and it's, uh, and it's T, the letter for America, dot for, uh, or you can find it, I think we have a story on it on the front page, so you can find it through that. <coughs> also, we're sort of, it was very uh, sort of loose, but we're sort of beginning to form a kind of walkable Houston coalition here. And this is in response to the mixed use uh, committee of the city, which is looking at all the urban corridor stuff for the new for the new light rail stations that will open in 2012, the station areas and how the pedestrian routes will work and so forth. If you are an organization that would have some interest in what happens around the stations, whether it's bikes or pedestrians or whatever. Uh, I guess the best thing would be to send me a note and say you'd like to talk about being involved in this welcome with Houston thing. So far it's Houston Tomorrow, Citizens for Transportation Coalition, and RichmondRail.org. And we are today sending some, a draft of some uh, standards, I guess you would say, to the Mixed Use Committee, which we'll meet today. Those meetings are open to the public, and they're happening every two weeks approximately. The one today is at 3.30. And it's at the at 611 Walker, the public works building downtown on the sixth floor. You can't say anything, but you can observe. 
and then you can keep members even have of your organizations informed about what's going on. Um, it's kind of a scary process, you know, because it's overwhelming with the dollars, but, uh, um, but it's, it's actually moving along in, I would say, about a 75% pretty good direction, and, and it's not over, so we have a long way. Uh, again, if you could just send me a note, uh, david.crossley at houstontomorrow.org, and we'll get you involved if you want to be involved in that. Okay. Uh, anybody else got announcements about anything that's happening we should know about? Or? Um, by the way, on our website, I know HJC is about to have something about the, um, the uh, amendments to the Transportation Improvement Plan, the public event, February 12th, am I right? Or something like that. Anyway, it's on our website. <laughs> so if you just go to the site every day and look at the events, we're, there's a calendar and you can see what's going on every day. And we're trying to get everything. And we're also starting to do minutes and notes from all the meetings that we can attend. So that's starting to appear on the website too. So today our, uh, our speaker is going to be Jeff Table talking about the Clean Waters Initiative. Uh, Jeff's been really busy. He and I and John Jacob gave some presentations in Albuquerque last week and it's like changes his presentation topic every three days. <laughs> so so uh, this is the first time we've talked about water in this group high time. So Jeff, you want to just get us going? Thank you and uh, thank you for bearing with us in our, in our room switch. I hope we're done with you. Technical. Mr. Jerry, I see you moved. Can everybody else yeah, see okay back there? Sorry about that. And uh, for the uh, camera, I may move around a little bit if that's all right. Uh, I said you're right, so it's well. Most of the time when uh, I've, I've watched presentations and, and given presentations to this group, we've focused on things like urban form and sidewalks and freeways and buses and not too much on, on this water stuff. Uh, what I'm gonna to try to do today is, uh, first of all, just bring you up to speed on, on what's going on in, in regional planning for water quality. And, and I hope uh, plant in your minds uh, the idea that really what we're doing on the water quality side is all very closely related to uh, what's done on land use and what's done on transportation and a really uh, more holistic look at a sustainable future for Houston. Anybody know where that shot is from? Cypress, Cypress Creek. Yes, uh, we are blessed uh, with many really tremendous uh, natural resources, uh, habitats, uh, water courses in our region. And uh, a publication that we have, uh, which you're welcome to take, uh, is called How's the Water? I would answer for a region of five and a half million people with a big industrial base. It's actually pretty good. It's actually pretty good. But we do face some significant challenges uh, with the growth that we're expecting, especially. So what we've tried to do, uh, we have a number of different water quality programs at HGC. They're sort of funded in different silos, uh, mainly from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. We're trying to begin to present to the public more of a window, as that can be the DOS in the background, and that we kind of loosely called these uh, in, in aggregate uh, our clean waters initiative. So I want to share that with you. But first, uh, just in case you didn't know, I think that our region may be uh, the most watered, <laughs> that's the right term, of any metro region in the United States. We've done some, some looking around and uh, with our dense network of bayous and wetlands and bays and estuaries and coastal frontage, uh, we've calculated that we have over 16 thousand miles of streams and shoreline. So this is the defining environmental feature in a region that lacks uh, mountains and other iconic uh, environmental features. David uh, at the Smart Growth Conference I thought was very interesting. He said that outside of, of Houston, the perception of our area is, well, we don't have any environment. What that means is we don't have any mountains. Uh, but we have something else that I think is, is quite amazing. Those uh, red areas are uh, bases that are covered in our Clean Rivers uh, Assessment Program, which we'll get to in just a bit. Looked at another way, we have this, this phenomenal Galveston Bay estuary system. You see the ship channel coming through. And uh, as, as David has argued, uh, we have the ecosystem of the Gulf of Mexico. I think a lot of times we tend to get into our, our you know, looking at the car in front of us on the way home and forget that uh, in a lot of ways, we really live 
in what could be an eco wonderland. You'll pardon the term. So all is good, right? Well, that's uh, maybe not the case. Uh, these, these red watercourses, and we don't have all the little fingerlets that are seen on the other map. These are, are major designated streams uh, by the DCQ. The ones which are in red are the ones that don't meet their current water quality standards. I think it's about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Carl, about 66% of our region's streams. Uh, mostly in the urbanized areas that the good news is if you see up um, Lake Conroe, Lake Livingston, uh, water sources to the north, uh, it's still pretty good. Uh, one of the problems though, we, we also get drinking water out of this body, Lake Houston, and uh, we're, we're beginning to see potential threats <coughs> as, as development occurs in Montgomery County and the tributaries to uh, Lake Houston that uh, our, our water supply could be impacted. And I think this is very important because in, in talking about water with elected officials and even the public, I think there's often a perception of, you know, I don't swim in that, uh, I don't fish in that, uh, you know, I don't really come into direct contact with a lot of that water if I can help it. So why should I be asked to regulate something or spend a lot of money fixing up a treatment plant or a collection system. So it doesn't, doesn't seem as immediate. Uh, I think as it gets to the point where our drinking water supplies begin to be impacted, uh, it could be a concern. So, so who is this a problem for? Well, <laughs> part of that eco-wonderland concept uh, I was telling you is, is this rich array, uh, again, primarily of, of aquatic and riparian habitat uh, is, is probably, we're arguing about this in Albuquerque too, probably the one or two of the most ecologically diverse urban regions in the United States. Uh, probably pretty significant on a worldwide basis. And clearly, uh, if we're continuing to degrade those waterways, uh, we are not particularly helping uh, make it a friendlier place for those guys and, and their friends. Uh, add on to this the fact that in the next 30 years, we're projecting the famous three and a half million people. And uh, what we contribute as people uh, to that water <coughs> is as follows. We have, uh, is it about a thousand discharges, Todd? We've got a thousand uh, wastewater treatment plant discharges in a region. It's hard to see how many of them, because uh, <coughs> Harris County, East Harris County, they are so densely packed uh, that on this, what we call the measles map, uh, it's a little bit hard to uh, make out where all those plants are. This is uh, by and large or, or entirely a function of the way that development has been financed in our region. Uh, if, if you look up in Dallas, Fort Worth, for example, I think they've got about a dozen big regional treatment plants that all those cities tie into. Most of our suburban growth uh, during the boom years uh, those plants were financed and operated by municipal utility districts. So they were, were put up uh, basically covering just the subdivisions uh, that they served. And, and they were financed on bonds paid off by the, the mud fees, the residents. So uh, a lot of people thought that was a really good idea. It's truly pay as you grow. And uh, we're, we're doing incremental financing of those facilities rather than having all the taxpayers uh, pay to finance that. Uh, the tacit assumption, though, of, of this approach, I believe, was that one day the city of Houston or somebody is going to go out and annex all that and hook them up onto the main system. A lot of these plants were, were what we call small package plants. They're, they're automated, and they weren't really expected to last for 40 years uh, or long periods of time. Uh, the other problem with this approach is uh, it creates quite an enforcement problem for the TCEQ. Uh, you can get around pretty frequently to 12 regional plants. Uh, getting around to a thousand small plants uh, would take more uh, resource than right now they put into enforcement. So a lot of the data that's actually looked at uh, is, is what we call self-reporting data. The plants will just 
uh, provide their, their readings. Uh, and it may not be the best way, especially to uh, catch those, uh, those unexpected discharges or rent malfunctions. So part of it is, uh, is uh, the proliferation of these plants and the uh, potential for upset. Part of it is even with the permitted values, even if the plants are functioning correctly, the, uh, and God remind me what those things stand for. Uh, Carbonaceous bio, biogradable oxygen demand, uh, ammonia nitrogen, and total suspended salt. And, and those are, are the three uh, big ones that we track as, as kind of indicators. That, that what it, that's what is legally allowed to course through the system based on our population. <coughs> that were carried into the water in garbage trucks as opposed to in, in uh, suspensions of, of wastewater discharges. That's what we would be putting into an annual, uh, annually into our waterway. So that, that's something for us to think about. The other thing that is, is even more daunting to think about, uh, and if you live in an older neighborhood like me, you've experienced this, that the pipes under your house Great when they get old, and uh, we don't really know quite how how big that problem is. Uh, but I'm going to show you a slide that uh, it gives us a little bit of cause for concern. Uh, the other thing, unbelievably to me, in, in the uh, fourth largest city and I guess the tenth or ninth largest metro area in the U.S., we have a lot of urban subdivisions that are still on septic. And uh, a lot of these were in, in uh, <coughs> soils and on lot sizes that really were never meant to be handled uh, by a septic tank. And I think, again, uh, as with uh, the small treatment plants, the assumption was, well, someday the city is going to come and hook all those people up. <coughs> well, in the meantime, <laughs> and we've done some studies of a few of these areas that suggest there's, there's some direct discharges going on uh, from failing septic systems. Uh, very significant problem, especially if uh, you have uh, kids in the neighborhood who might want to play in a ditch or, or a situation like that. You add to uh, the, we, we tend to call the wastewater discharge point sources because they're <coughs> regulated, you know, there's, there's a pipe that theoretically you can measure what comes out of and regulate it. Uh, equally of concern is what washes in through the storm sewers or washes over the land that we call non-point sources. And uh, a lot of that is impacted by the amount of impervious surface. And uh, here's a map where we, we just show population density uh, per, I guess, meter, what's the scale on that? Density per uh, thousand square, square mile. Square mile. Okay. <coughs> so uh, below 100 people per square mile, we're calling that green. Uh, but you can look as we grow into 2035, uh, how much of the land is actually being converted from, uh, I'll go toggle that one more time, uh, especially in the uh, north, <coughs> west, and south suburbs, how much that land is being converted <coughs> from this sort of environment, which you know, may seem like, gee, that's, that's a field that needs to be developed, I and mean, that's progress, but actually, uh, that is a very effective water storage and filtration system, as well as providing some habitat for some of those uh, folks I showed you in the earlier slide. We're estimating that we are going to replace 306 square miles of this with this. Now, I'm, I'm not going to posit that this can't be done in such a way to prevent non-point source pollution. I just think we need to be careful about how we do it and be aware of what we're doing going in uh, before we commit to that much of a transition. The other thing uh, that is a problem is uh, we're, we're sometimes our own worst enemy. Uh, we, we don't necessarily do uh, our best by the water. Uh, just by fertilizer and insecticides. I don't know how many of us really do this anymore, but uh, some do. And uh, as, a, as a former dog owner, uh, I once did a little estimate that, uh, how many of you have dogs here in this room, just out of curiosity? So I'm gonna say that's about a third, right? 
So if we assume a third of the dogs in Harris County, a third of the, the 1.2 million dogs, that's a lot of dogs, you know, when you won't say more, it's a lot of dogs out there. And uh, the, the real issue, uh, it's, I'm saving you punch, that the, the reason why I said at the beginning our water quality is, is really not too bad uh, for a big urban area is as far as the things we think of uh, when we think of, of water problems, you know, the ship channel catching fire or dioxin or, or uh, toxic chemicals or heavy metals, we don't, we don't really have too much of that <laughs> considering uh, the heavy industrial area we have. What we have in abundance is bacteria. Now, bacteria is a little bit of a difficult uh, difficult thing to get a handle on how we stop the pollution uh, from that because it's not uh, easy to directly measure and it also has uh, a life of its own, i.e., you know, we didn't pick up after that dog and some bacteria gets into a slow-moving warm <coughs> water body, it can kind of grow on its own. So as we debate, you know, should we tighten up uh, treatment plant uh, requirements or should we force the city to replace uh, uh, broken lines, or, or should we enforce against residents and fix their septic tanks? Uh, there's a lot of argument and debate about, uh, well, we can't really tell who's contributing what to that. And once it's contributed, natural factors uh, tend to cause it to grow and to behave in ways uh, that we're not real sure about either. So we've, we've tried to simplify this as best we can uh, into kind of a sliding scale. We know that, uh, that bacteria basically is contributed by people and animals. And maybe we think about people here with wastewater treatment plants, animals here with, with cows and pigs and chickens, and maybe dogs over here, which are animals, but people kind of control <laughs> what they contribute to the water. And, and the three real systems we have to impact this are fixing up wastewater treatment plants, obviously, and, and the storm or, uh, collection lines. We can focus on urban stormwater systems, which do have, like a treatment plant, a place where they discharge. So sometimes uh, regulatory agencies view those as a quote, point source. And then what do we do about just generalized surface runoff? I think <coughs> sometimes uh, it's, it's just taking the one bite of an elephant at People throw up their hands and say, you know, those slides showed at the beginning this is a daunting problem, we can't address it. We're really looking at trying to address this in a more systematic sense. What can we do in each of these boxes uh, to limit uh, those contributions? And more importantly, where should we do it? One of the things that uh, you'll be familiar with uh, in some of the talks uh, that have been given here is this idea of the urban transit that in higher density environments versus suburban versus rural, uh, we might have a different suite of transportation or land use strategies. We think the same is true of water quality. And uh, I've, I've borrowed this slide a little bit, but uh, in, in these zones, the urban center, the urban core, this would basically be uh, equivalent, I'm guessing, to our, our higher intensity areas. I won't, David, say inside the loop, but uh, in those higher intensity areas, uh, we're not really going to be able to, well, I don't think we're going to be able to tear out a bunch of these apartments and put in a, uh, a settling pond, for example. Some of these more environmental uh, <coughs> green infrastructure approaches really aren't going to work there. And as far as runoff, uh, our suite of tools uh, really is, is maybe going to seem more minimal, but uh, it's going to be things like green roofs and, and inlet separators, and, and frankly, education about dogs and maintenance of sewer lines, that sort of thing. Uh, as we get out into the, uh, the suburbanizing fringe, here is where we think that uh, these principles called low impact development uh, may have a lot of promise. Uh, is there a way we can design uh, drainage systems, for example, uh, as is done in the woodlands, uh, that give water a chance to collect and settle and, and give that bacteria activity a chance to settle down 
uh, before it's discharged back into the waterways. Now, the, the Smart Growth and the LID people have kind of been at loggerheads uh, for a while. Uh, there were a couple sessions at the Smart Growth Conference where this came up of cities well-intentioned have passed LID requirements that are requiring on-site you know, stormwater detention on small urban infill projects. And I think this is a real important point. Uh, when you think about the totality of, of contributions of runoff and uh, other environmental insults, uh, if you've got an area where people can walk to the store, who can catch a bus, uh, that intensity of activity, uh, I am of the belief uh, with those who say, go ahead and pave that over. Uh, once that watershed is about 40% impervious anyway, having some little LID uh, inside a dense urban area really is not going to give you that much incremental good. Probably makes more sense to get those people out of their cars as often as you can than to block a redevelopment project with, with some little retention time. However, Certainly, if, if an area is going to grow at suburban densities and you're planning greenfield development, by all means, yes, yes, that should be integrated. But we think most promising of all is looking in these outer zones. Uh, how can we really use the ecological services uh, that nature already provides uh, in those, those uh, preserved areas? And where they are in agriculture, we want to preserve local agriculture too. Uh, what kind of management practices uh, can we use with farmers and ranchers? Uh, I'm going to show you a little illustration of how much impact even just a little bit of planning uh, and implementation would do in one of our fastest growing watersheds, the aforementioned Cypress Creek, which uh, is also uh, prepared for bacteria and thieves Lake Houston. Uh, again, using the same map without the green on it, uh, this is population density in the Cypress Creek watershed. Uh, I'll give you a few orienting points. This is 290. Here's the watershed boundary. That means the area that drains into the creek. And uh, this is current or 2005 development. Most of it east of 290. Okay, 2035. That's Ridgeland, which I guess is general growth is trying to sell right now. But there's there's about 600 homes out there, and we're beginning to see uh, a little bit of, of uh, expansion into the, the more pristine western part of the watershed. And here is just a comparison of population in each zone. And the impervious surface change doesn't look like a lot, but those Ridgeland and these scattered uh, squares are still almost five square miles of impervious surface in that fairly pristine West Cypress Creek zone. Now let's let's look at this another way. Suppose we let Bridgeland develop. It's already padded. There's houses under construction. They're actually doing some good uh, low impact design and conservation principles uh, in their plan. But what if we found a way to block the rest of them. I'm going to go back and look at something. That is our trend forecast. That's the other one. Pay attention to the east side of 290 when I toggle it again. It doesn't change much. We could easily fit all of that growth into the already urbanized and probably degraded portion of the watershed. Uh, without really making it a lot more crowded for people. And uh, as, if you think about this, this Cypress Creek is picking up junk all the way down. We already know there's going to be a lot of junk in there. Uh, you want it to start out as clean as possible. And I know what you're thinking. Uh, better make sure my uh, money shot is actually next. <laughs> You're thinking, well, those just look like a, a lot of little dots out there. I mean, how much, and now you let Bridgeland happen, how much would that really help? How many of you have been to an event at Reliance Stadium? Would you be surprised to learn that if we could keep that out of the West Watershed, it would be equal uh, to offsetting the impacts of the full Reliance Stadium complex? 
Well, then it would really surprise you to know that it would be equivalent to 14 Reliance Stadium complexes. Because all of the roofs and ancillary parking lots and driveways and street system that goes with servicing uh, those scattered dots in that west watershed uh, would add up to 3.1 of those 4.8 square miles. So it doesn't seem like a lot. But if we can get into the outer reaches of these watersheds and really do some, some conservation measures, uh, we're going to send that water in as clean as we can when it gets into the city, where we're more constrained in what we can do about it. We are right now, I'm sorry this is a little bit hard to see, uh, we are working on updating for our regional transportation map uh, an adopted list of, of areas of concern. Uh, prime conservation areas, as you see a lot of them are in the riparian zones and floodplains, some of our waterways on the periphery. And there is actually, it's kind of washed out on this slide, uh, a gray zone of, of secondary concern. So can, can we start agreeing as a region, elected officials, uh, in, in what would be priorities for conservation and water quality being one of those elements? And what if we really pooled our resources to, quote, save the best of the best? Well, what resources, you ask? Uh, it's really going to be a magic buckshot approach. Uh, maybe they roll that into cost of transportation projects. Uh, maybe some sort of collaborative uh, bond issue. Maybe private sources, uh, conservation easements, you name it. But uh, I think the concept of the strategy is right now is the time. Uh, fortunately, those, those outer watersheds are still in pretty good shape. Uh, that's where we really need to be focused, in my opinion, not on requiring attention in small townhouse projects inside the loop. Uh, in that, those next two zones, uh, where we must suburbanize, and we must, uh, three and a half million people. Uh, I know David has uh, shown what to take to fit them all in the transit zones. My belief is we probably won't get there, but where we must, uh, this, I wish were in our region, it's in the DFW region, but there are, there are now some fantastic projects in Texas uh, that have really incorporated uh, these ecological services into their subdivision design. I don't have a site map, but this project, I think, is about 80% uh, open, even though it has some very high density elements to it, a Montgomery Farm outside of Allen, Texas. And then when, when we get into those suburbanizing areas, uh, and we must do, do man-made, if you will, controls, let's do what Harris County Flood Control is doing, and others, and, and really let nature do the job. Uh, where we've got space, where we've got land, uh, where we can create amenities, and, and let those very effective wetland functions uh, do their work. So again, we're talking about really a focused strategy, not a generalized strategy. Uh, in those, those orange, red areas, uh, we really need to focus on good housekeeping, but, but we probably are better served environmentally by filling that on up. Uh, I think really looking at enforcement, and education in those areas, and maintenance uh, is the key. In that fringe, wherever that winds up being, uh, I think there's where we really ought to push low impact development and conservation design practices. And then focus heavily in, in the outskirts on conservation. And this last bullet is not endorsed by the Houston Galveston Area Council Board of Directors or any of its affiliates. Uh, it's an idea I'm throwing out there. What if we had a greenfield impact fee, uh, just like you would have a fee to hook your development up to a sewer system uh, where if you're taking ecological services out of play in that West Cypress Creek zone, uh, you would, would have a fee based on the ecological uh, service value. Uh, and, and the incentive would be if you go in the East zone, there's no fee. The services are, are urban. We've got our own systems for capturing value of that. Uh, that might be a mechanism I would argue a market-based mechanism uh, that could raise funding to acquire uh, some of those conservation areas we talked about. So that, that's kind of our, our vision of what could be focused on uh, a quality strategy uh, in our region. 
I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what we're actually doing right now in HJC's Clean Water Initiative. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're working on is a series of, of model watershed protection plans. Uh, we've got a draft uh, prepared in the Westfield Estates area, which is mainly a plan looking at remediating uh, on-site septic tanks. Uh, we actually have, have gotten a pretty big grant from uh, EPA and DCEQ to work uh, with the county and the improvement district there to help residents replace some of these uh, failing septic tanks uh, while we wait eventually for them to be hooked up to the city system. Uh, totally different end of the spectrum. Uh, we're working in a Bastrop Bayou in Brazoria County, uh, much more of an agriculturally focused uh, project to develop a protection plan down there. It's going to be a little bit of a mix of uh, guarding against uh, impacts of urbanization, but also focusing on those agricultural best management practices. We're actually going to partner with some landowners to do some demonstration projects down there in Basket Bayou. We have uh, an annual document called the Water Quality Management Plan. It hasn't been maybe as great a planning tool uh, as it could have been for us in the years past because there are just so many hundreds of those plants. It's been very hard, and, and this is what a service area looks like, been very hard to really hook that up with our GIS and, and understand where we might have issues. We're, we're getting much closer to being able to do that and being able to show elected officials you know, where are areas that based on age might be the best candidates uh, for collection line maintenance. Uh, which service areas are going to grow in population we might want to be looking at those permits. Which plants could potentially be consolidated into a regional facility. And then doing training workshops, we're going to focus those much more on, on LID and conservation subdivision design. So really a, kind of a, a forward-looking strategy with our water quality management plan that we haven't uh, had as much uh, chance to do in the past. Uh, finally, we are convening or have convened an omnibus group, the big, as we call it, or bacteria implementation group. I guess that's the water getting cleaner that goes uh, the other way. But uh, this, this is one of the biggest, most